Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm going to be doing another haul. Uh, not quite a fall haul, uh, but just I'm going to be going through some of the books that I've got over the last couple months since I did the last one of these videos. I know it's been a while since I've done a video. I only did a couple or a few last month. Um, I hope to get more into the swing of it this month, but I wanted to go through just, just the things that I picked up recently. Now, I have a bunch of stuff that's coming, and I honestly was trying to wait for a lot of it because I think some of it's really exciting stuff, but it's not here, and I don't know exactly when it's coming, so I'm just going to do what I have now, and then, you know, maybe I'll just review stuff as it comes. But I want to start with this beautiful, beautiful Moria book. So this is the special edition of the One Ring Moria edition. Um, it is gorgeous. So the book you can see is just beautifully designed. Absolutely fantastic. Um, it's nice uh, matte finish. There's a um, bit of a texture to the words. There's Durin's door or the doors of Moria. And on the back you have a great inscription there. The world is gray, the mountains old, the forge's fire is ashen cold. No harp is rung, no hammer falls, the darkness dwells in Durin's halls. So this is a, just a fantastic book. I've already gone through the, 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 re the review of this, the flip through of the alpha version. This is the final version of the book. And it's just gorgeous, as you can see. The maps, the pages, the incidental art, it's just fantastic you know it's as as beautiful as I thought it was in the the PDF version full piece of art, full pages of art at times it's probably hard to read the words but they're just beautiful there's little quotations frequently from either the Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit throughout um, there's a nice ribbon actually there are two one and two. So you get two ribbons in this book, which is fantastic. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous book. I am so happy that I got it. Look at that great piece of art there. Fell foes. This book has the best piece of art for the Balrog I've ever seen. I think it's the best take on the Balrog of Moria. Here it is. Shadow and flame. Let's see if I can get a closer look for you. Look at that. So good. Again, that's the best version of the Balrog I've ever seen. I love it. This book is just fantastic. I've gone through it before, so I'm not going to go through it in too much more detail here, but it's just really, really good. There's the Watcher in the Water. Great maps throughout. Isometric. Flavorful. Really, really one of the best books I own. <laughs> really, it's one of my favorite things that I own. Great art. In fact, I put up the uh, cloth map. So when it came, I got three cloth maps. I almost showed those, but they're actually up on my wall now. So I put them up on my wall around my computer. So I can always look at them. So I have a map of Eriador, the Shire, and the map of Moria. And they're all in cloth. And they're nice and big and they're really soft. It's really cool. I like to look at them. So this is just a fantastic book. I highly recommend you guys check this one out. You know, the special edition, I don't know if you can get any more. Maybe you can. Um, the... There's Gandalf's run down there. The original, of course, is still awesome, but the special edition cover, hardback, with this beautiful faux leather, plasticky. Um, it's, it's actually not that heavy, which means the page quality, I'm not sure how it is, but... You, you can't tell by looking at the pages, but it's a very, it's actually a fairly light book. For being 200 pages, I mean that thick, it's actually not very heavy. It's surprisingly light. So, I don't know what that says about the quality of the pages, but again, you wouldn't notice it by looking at them. There's no bleed through, there's no problems there. Um, but, you know, who knows? I haven't had it for very long, so maybe it won't hold up as well, but I hope it does. This is a great book, and I plan on using it quite a lot, uh, even if just for inspiration for other D&D games, even if I don't run Moria itself. So this is a great book. The next couple things that I wanted to go through are these two. The Hounds, oops, sorry, upside down. I'm used to, for these, for these I'm used to holding things upside down. Um, right, Raiding the Obsidian Keep and the Hounds of Hendenburg. These are both, for old school essentials, they are dungeons and they are by the Merry Mushmen. 
Now, uh, the hounds, the horrendous hounds of Hendenburg, actually was based on a Cairn adventure that I reviewed before, and I have already clicked through these, I believe, um, very recently. They are awesome, so I'm not going to go through them in too much more detail. But I just love these particular copies. First of all, they just like the uh, other one; they come apart, and so you can use this as a bit of a screen if you want. It has maps on the one side, and on the other, you get player-facing things. So you get the hex crawl, you get the town, and you get, are your players yearning to direct to adventure in a direction that's blank on your map? Roll a d10, either once or twice for more variety. And basically you have two tables. One is what lies beyond the cryptwood and why go there of just random adventure seeds beyond the adventure. I actually, some of these are really cool. I'll read a couple. Uh, the Holy Tundra, a cold and desolate land whose scattered population yearns to be liberated from the authoritarian rule of the Knights of the Copper Chalice. Or the Tower of Marvolo the Magnificent, reclusive wizard widely considered the greatest spellcaster alive. Or the Bog of Arn, where furred crocodiles prey upon fools who stray from the narrow causeway that marks the only safe passage through the deadly mire. The long and the lonely and long abandoned fortress city of Bozadi, built to guard against attacks from an empire that fell a millennium ago. So a bunch of really cool ideas, and then below that is why go there. Uh, a refugee nobleman seeks a cure for his now feral daughter, confined to a golden cage since she succumbed to a mysterious malady. Or, the bankrupt Duchess of Blackwater has failed to pony up an ancient dragon's tribute. Nobles and common folk alike watch the skies and prepare for the worst. Or a dissolute centaur outcast claims she has found the lost grave of the first Kagan. She is willing to show the location to anyone willing to pay her bar tab. Robard Reed, a famously wealthy king of Osrage, recently vanished while traversing the region. Adventurers descend upon the land hoping to recover the late king's priceless crown. So a bunch of cool little adventures, uh, seeds, and uh, then again some cool maps for the adventure, but the, the Hounds of Hendenburg is just a fantastic adventure. It's a second level OSE adventure. Uh, it's a nice little flip paperback. Uh, the quality is not the highest, but it's fine. It's definitely um, it's definitely usable and it's definitely uh, just sufficient. And and I think that the outside quality and the pages generally are, are probably sufficient to stand up even if you don't have the binding around them. I think it's why they've been chosen. So it's, it's kind of tough. It feels kind of rough. It's not smooth to the touch, but it's has a little bit of a texture to it. But it feels like it, it'll probably hold up. Um, it's not the most pleasant thing for me to touch. I don't know, maybe that's a texture thing. I'm just a weird texture person. But, um, but I, I think it'll actually be fine. It'll hold up. The art is great. The cryptwood is interesting. There's a lot of new locations. So if you've if you've seen the Hounds of Hendenburg, the the Cairn adventure, it's very short. This has been expanded quite a bit with new locations, lots of new art. Uh, it's been tooled for old school essentials rather than Cairn. Um, so that you know that requires some ad adaptation. Great pieces of art for the bandit and his lady, um, for the seer, and uh, then there are a bunch of dungeons. A wyvern's nest, and there's a bunch of dungeons. This is the sort of thing that would really work in Dolman Wood. Now, I've already gone through it again in some more detail, so I'm not going to do that here. I like the fact that the art throughout uh, follows the story of, a, of one adventuring party from beginning to end. Um, you see their you see their story, um, and that's kind of cool. And at the very back, there is a character sheet with some uh, potential retainers and replacement characters just before that, so pre-made characters if you want to use those. So that's great. The Horrendous Hounds of Hendenburg. And then the, the obsidian, the raiding the obsidian keep is similar. It also has, um, it also has the same thing uh, where you slide off the cover, and the inside once again has maps and stuff that you'd need for the dungeon. The obsidian keep itself, the whole map of the dungeon. It's just one big dungeon. So instead of having you know things broken up into many different locations the way that the Hounds of Hendenburg does, which is a hex crawl, this is, it's a, it's basically a series of point crawls sailing up the bay, and then walking up the beach, and then you get to the, the keep itself, which is up here. So you sail up, and then you walk up, and then you get to the keep, and then you run the dungeon. So there's an adventure getting there, and then there's the dungeon itself. It reminds me in that way a little bit of something like, um, oh gosh, what's the Deep Carbon Observatory, where there's sort of a flooded valley, and you have to go through it, point crawl, kind of point to point, and then you get to the dungeon at the end. That's a little bit like this. 
and uh, that's kind of what's going on here. Uh, except this is a magma flow instead of a flooded valley, so I think that's interesting. Then you have the Trail of Firmesh, which is um, use this table below the uh, in the sessions before you run the adventure, so the players have an idea of what the Red Priests are about. So basically, you use these rumor tables to develop the cult that's worshiping Vermash, this creature. And you add in these tables in the sessions before you actually go run this adventure. So because this is for levels 2 through 4, you might run a couple adventures first um, for level 1, level 2, or something like that, and the players are hearing these rumors about these Red Priests. And then suddenly they hear about a disaster that has struck the Red Priests. Once again, there's just great art in this book. Um, and once again, the texture is the same with the pages, so you get that kind of hardier paper uh, stock. Um, uh, and I think, again, so it's, it's hard to say in terms of quality. I don't like the texture feeling. <laughs> That's just me. But again, I think some people, no, most people, I think 90% of people won't mind it. But I think it's chosen specifically because it'll stand up. It'll hold up. Um, it kind of have like a, a, I don't know, like a, like a trail guide. I don't know if you guys have ever been like hiking and you've taken one of those trail guides from like the ranger station. It kind of feels like something like that. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but it has that sort of quality to it. Like you're going to put it in your pocket and it's going to stand up to things for a while. That'll be legible for a long time. The Harbor of Death with some great pieces of art throughout. I really like this one. Really like this one a lot. Great piece of art there. It's huge carving in the cliff face to Survivor Beach with some encounters and some locations. Great ones. And then you get to the Obsidian Keep itself, and it's a great dungeon with lots of crazy things happening. These worms have infested people and mutated them, and they can infest you. you got to be careful. And there's lots of NPCs to interact with, which is great. Uh, lots of good choices to make. There aren't maps repeated that, that frequently in the dungeon. You get them every few pages, which is nice, but you're going to have the little booklet with you, and so you're going to be able to see every page, and so it's not a huge, huge deal. There's a vampire in here, which is really funny. Um, her legs and teeth have been removed, so she's not a threat. But if somehow you restore her, she is by far the biggest threat in here, and she becomes a supervillain if you can restore her, so that's a great uh, side thing. There's a vampire here. It's kind of turned into like an object of, of fun and advice, you know, made it harmless. But it's great. There's some weird encounters too, really weird encounters. And then again, at the end, you have the last couple pages. You have appendices with um, replacement characters and retainers. Um, and each of these suggests that you have the Knock number three book because uh, the Merry Mushmen do Knock, which is that series of kind of a compilation of essays and dungeons and zines and things um, that are all about old school gaming. And these people put it together, and so it's a great. Um, it's a great supplement. I have all three knock editions right now. I think there's only three. Might be four, but I think there's only three. I have all three right now, and um, this book kind of references it from time to time. So does the other. So Raiding the Obsidian Keep, really cool. Okay, um, I have a couple of these. These are zines that I kickstarted. Um, this is the Shadow Over Gloomshire. I think I have maybe even reviewed this one before. I don't remember, um, but I wanted to include it just because I have the zine exactly. Um, and it's it's great. It's what you'd expect. It's a Dragon Bane zine. Some of the art, you know, now that I look at it, I think I have actually reviewed it even in a flip through before. Um, so I'm not going to go over it in too much detail. And I certainly have already clicked through it. But Shadow Over Gloomshire is a cool adventure. It came with a lot of extra stuff. Um, if you're doing Dragon Bane, I think it's a good sort of gothic horror adventure. You should check that out, Shadow Over Gloomshire. But I realized I did flip through that one before. <laughs> I included it. Here's one that I haven't, though the 8 bit theater role playing game. So 8-Bit Theater was a webcomic. I don't know if you guys read it. I read the heck out of it. It was it's so good. 8-Bit Theater is fantastic. And he, uh, Brian Clevenger, I think is how you say his name. Brian Clevenger came up with a, a RPG where you get to play as the Four Light Warriors or the Four Dark Warriors or the pirates or the monsters you get to pick. But if you, if you know it, it's basically a take on Final Fantasy's standard, hey, you're the Four Heroes of Light and you have to go and save the realm from darkness. But it's just a it's just disaster. One disaster after another. 8-Bit Theater, the role-playing game, where you're the light warriors getting escaped to save a bunch of worlds. But it always goes wrong because they are real bad at this. Light warriors are real bad at this. So the art is sort of like a... I think he even says it. It's like a don't-sue-me version of Final Fantasy 1. 
So it's close, but not quite Final Fantasy 1. Uh, all the things that you see throughout, which is fine. <laughs> you get a table of contents here. Um, and the text is very small. So it's a, sh it's a short scene. It's only 30 some pages, but you get a lot of stuff on those pages because the text is small. Wolf. It's illegal to make a fantasy RPG that does not include at least one wolf enemy. That's true. So the tone is very tongue-in-cheek. It's very funny. It's making fun of, or, I mean, in, in, a, in a loving way, making fun of Final Fantasy, making fun of games. The Red Mage, for example, his skill is min-max, which is great. And I love it. If you've ever played or seen Final Fantasy, or rather, if you've ever read um, the uh, Ape at Theater, I, the fact that Fighter has a genius of four is amazing to me. That's hilarious. It's his stat. He's a, a genius of four. Fighter is so dumb. So dumb, but he always somehow gets out of problems um, through his dumbness. And so it kind of makes sense. His genius of four, he can come up with stupid plans and they still work. I like that. Thief, his, uh, his uh, famous catchphrase is you steal anything that's not nailed down and on fire. Right? So if it's nailed down, you steal it. If it's on fire, you steal it. If it's both, maybe you leave it. And yeah, of course, black mage. Dwarf, no, nothing's wrong. That's just how they smell. To them, it's normal. <laughs> Um, and then you get uh, encounters and how that works, how the battle map works. Turns, stunts, common types of stunts, basically how to play the game. It's a fairly straightforward RPG. Um, death, collateral damage, the doom clock. Basically, one of the, one of the um, features of this game is that bad stuff is going to be happening every time you do something. There's always going to be collateral damage. Uh, innocent bystander, here's the target priority. Innocent bystander should get it first, then the environment, then any light warrior, then enemies. Right, so if collateral damage occurs, first kill any innocent bystander that's nearby. Then stuff blows up. Then light warriors can take more damage, if it would be even funnier for them to get smacked around more. And then finally, you can use the enemies. Right, that's, that's, that's the one thing you can do. Um, this is a last resort and really should only be used if it would subvert expectations so hard there's a very real chance of someone peeing themselves from laughter. Hey, it's not my house. Right, so obviously tongue-in-cheek, you're, you're meant to make things go horribly wrong. Horrible de deeds of your shameful se uh, horrible results of your shameful deeds, excuse me. Uh, making enemies, every every possible RPG enemy and how to do it, infinite combinations with the last risk. Um, world building, how to build a hex map, the home base, genre, the orbs and fiends, summon chaos, the omelet theory. Listen, some worlds are gonna get broken. Maybe you goofed around too much. Maybe you didn't fully appreciate the scope of your actions. Maybe these people were just kind of rude and you're like, you know what? When the Light Warriors fail to defeat Chaos, it's because they died, big time. But as we already discussed, death is not the end for these little, uh, you know, languages. <laughs> Great mountains, dark forest, exploration. Factions, faction clocks, or not. Mood clocks, maybe. Adventures, great advice for running a certain kind of game. Um, and little bits of subsystems and things like that. And I think that's great. Advice for how to make memorable NPCs. It's an actually a very it's a very succinct, small, but great system with lots of good tables for making NPCs and stuff like that. Best people ever. Names and yeah, just tons of names. And these are the backers for the uh, for the uh, game. So I imagine you should just take these names and use them in your games because those are the people who backed it. Which means I'm on here. Which is great. Um, awesome. Well, this one's a fun one. More names that you can roll on. <laughs> Number 49 is just John with a question mark and an exclamation point. Setting information with some extra blank at the end. 8-Bit Theater, the role-playing game. Again, highly recommend you guys check that out. Brian Clevenger is hilarious. I loved 8-Bit Theater, so I, I was right on this. It's very small. Little flap, flip book pamphlet, but it's great. A couple things more, a few more things. I have Castle Elkenstone, which is a horror scenario by Jacob Fleming. I love Jacob Fleming. I love all of his work. I love his artwork, and I love his adventures that he's put together. This one is dark and grim. It's a horror adventure, um, and it is definitely horror, <laughs> but the art is great. Um, beginning the adventure, referees notes. If you're, if you're interested in running a very short one-shot, probably, I would imagine. Maybe maybe two-shot, but it feels more like a one-shot. Um, with a lot of talking and a lot of exploration and a lot of growing dread. 
this adventure is a good one. The Abbey of St. Zangim. And again, the art is just fantastic in setting the tone. Mapleton Farmstead. It's very simple. Um, maybe you play this in a couple of sessions, a few sessions, because there are a few different, like, scenes. And then, of course, when you get to Castle Elkinstone itself, you're probably going to have a little bit longer as you, as you grind through it. Um, you could use this for almost any system. I think this is for his his game, Dungeon Goons, but you could use any game for it. It's very simple, very straightforward. There are some simple die mechanics, but you could easily transfer them into other other games. There's a cult going on. There's a demon demon there. It's fun. It's a cool adventure. Um, and that's it. It's really, really, really short. 21. Yeah, Advanced Dungeon Goons. Gelatinous Cubism. I think it's a great little adventure. If you like the art, if you want to play a sort of horror adventure, again, you're going through a countryside with growing gloom and doom, and then eventually you get to the castle, and there's sort of a horrific cult doing horrific things with a demon there. I think this would be a fun one to play. It's a good, great piece of art on the cover. And again, the art throughout is great. So, I recommend you guys check that one out. Now, I got this. This is the Details of Our Escape, which is something I kickstarted a while back. It uses dominoes to solve its resolutions or to, to resolve this, the pro problems. So these are all, you're supposed to cut these out or print them out and use them as dominoes. Or you can use dominoes themselves, but again, these have particular card uh, co colors and things and cards, um, you know, combinations and stuff, but they're numbered, you can see. So um, these are one, or these are two. So there's, there's, there's things on them that you can use if you needed to use dominoes. Six stars, five, uh, five seashells, four buttons, three leaves. Again, so, so if you needed um, to just use a regular domino set, you could. But the, the actual game is very interesting. The details of our escape. It's a domino-based storytelling game for two to seven players. Cut out domino sheets and rules for solo play are included. So you can play it by yourself too. But it has little sheets there. The art in this book is what drew me to it. Possible Worlds Games. It reminds me of Ultraviolet Grasslands. Or Mobius. If you guys know Mobius. But the art is just so good. Weird and abstract. And basically you're playing a caravan. That's the idea. You're playing a caravan that's escaping, moving, and uh, you need to try to keep people alive and have people come and join the caravan and leave. You've all heard of the Caravan 2000 Strong. They're diverse in their needs and desires, but unified by two core beliefs. Anyone is welcome to join the caravan, and your city is their latest stop. You've decided to join, but who are you, and where? And then setting the stage, and there's different ones. Ancient history, horror, post-apocalyptic, dystopia, steampunk, etc. So you can take dominoes and figure out what is your genre. And that tells us about your starting city, then you can do a name for the city. Creating communities. Again, the art for the people reminds me of like Mobius. Or again, Ultraviolet Grasslands or something. Although it's done in this nice greenish, white, black style group table and they're sort of like works of fiction as you're reading through it it's like a story or like a little bit of I don't know in-world fiction that tells you what you're doing there great piece of art I love this one I saw it on during zine quest I think and I was like ooh and I was drawn to the art style and I decided to do it running in circles in circles in circles in circles in circles it's just in circles over and over and over and how to do that if you loop back onto yourself with your domino sequence. Basically just how to play, tables to use for the play, um, and then great pieces of art to inspire you with a little bit of fiction from time to time written in uh, the world of the caravan. Beautiful piece of art there. Final turn. And then solo play, team play, online play, and excerpts of play if you want to you know, kind of know how to do it with, again, some more fiction at the end there. It's almost more of like an experience. I mean, there is a game there, and you're, it's, it's a storytelling game, and so it's going to be up to you to kind of interpret things and to develop things moving forward. I like these sorts of games. I like games. It reminds me of, like, Saving the Soul, which is something I reviewed on the channel um, in digital form. It reminds me of that. If I could get a physical form of that, I would. That's a beautiful game. So, details of our escape. I recommend you guys check this out if you're interested in a very evocative, beautiful um, team game that's more about storytelling than about winning or something like that. I like it. Now I have three books that are very odd. <laughs> three
three very strange adventures. They're called Underworld Adventures, um, and they are uh, designed by retro video games, or they're inspired by retro video games, and they are basically designed to recreate The Legend of Zelda, the original Legend of Zelda. The maps are in that style. The, the features of each dungeon are like that. The art style is in the style of that. You can get bombs and blow up walls. When you die, you're expected to start at the beginning. It's written out uh, in stats for three different systems. Survive This, 5e, and DCC RPG. And it tells you how to modify things. It's interesting, I have to say. It's not my favorite. I thought it was going to be something slightly different. They're cool. Um, if you're into this, if you want to try it as like a, a gimmick, a novelty, I think it would be great. Three dungeons in this style might be a bit much. I know that some people are going to love it. Um, but part of the part of the love of the old video game is the aesthetic, the video, visual aesthetic, aesthetic, the music, the nostalgia. And the DM has that with these maps, but the players don't. And so you're just describing blank rooms of a monochrome color, basically, or a couple colors um, that are always square, that might have pillars in different locations. Um... Yeah, it, I don't know how well it translates to a tabletop RPG. That's that's my worry about this. I haven't played them yet, so I don't know. Now, I have played, years before this came out, one of my DMs years ago did this. He, he ran us through a dungeon, and he didn't tell us what it was. And it turns out, as we were going through it, I realized it was the first dungeon from the first Legend of Zelda. Um, it was... He, he just had described it that way, and so we were picking up, you know, we were fighting like one or three bats, <laughs> and then suddenly they would be fighting these things that came from the walls and grabbed us, and then we were picking up a boomerang, and we were picking up bombs, and I was like, oh man, this is Legend of Zelda. And so then I knew where to go, because I knew that first dungeon. So that was sort of fun, but the dungeon itself was like, we were kind of like, what is going on here? It's a little bare. It's a little empty compared to a D&D dungeon. Especially compared to the dungeons that this DM used to run, because he... He was always a crazy Gonzo dun the Funhouse dungeon guy. And so it was kind of bare. That That's my only worry about these dungeons, is that they might end up being... The aesthetic is really appealing to me as someone who loves the original Legend of Zelda, but I'm not going to be able to show my players the maps. I mean, maybe you could. But otherwise, I don't know. And my other issue with this is that a lot of the art is repeat. It's a lot of repetition. You see the same piece of art like two or three times on pages, and then later on you'll see it again, and then you might even see it again in the monster section. So, yeah, like there's the, the Dark Knight again. Instead of the Dark Knight, yeah, and there it is again. But it's the same stat block, so maybe that's explainable, but still. Um, you just see the same art a bit throughout these books. So they're, they're fun. They're certainly an interesting novelty. Um, Madness of the Magi. And I would, I would like to play them, I think, once with the right group. But if you're playing a dungeon crawl... Um, I think a lot of people are going to be kind of, in this day and age, a lot of people in 5e terms are going to be disappointed by the dungeon. DCC, uh, you might be able to pull it off with the DCC group. I don't know, survive this uh, as well. So they're interesting. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad I have them. I think they're fun uh, as a novelty. And again, I like looking through them because I like that aesthetic of the old retro video games. But again, I just don't know how well that translates into an actual tabletop experience. So, anyway, that's that'll have to do. Uh, the next one that I wanted to cover um, are two books. Um, I think I've, I've shown this before, but this is The Tune of Ostrobaris. I have, I finally got it um, in physical form. It's a great dungeon, but I've reviewed it at least once. <laughs> I've probably already flipped through it um, in my last flip through. So I'm not going to do that again here. Uh, I got the two Rainy City books which I think I've also flipped through now that I'm looking at them. <laughs> but the Rainy City books are great. I want to get more. I want to get the whole set um, of the Rainy City. It's a cool setting. Um, these are th true tales of ghasts and geists in the Rainy City. Uh, fantastic uh, bunch of folklore and fairy tales, or you know, folk tales about ghosts that you could put into your game. Jaunty Jenks and Haunts and Lord Oberon's audacious players. and Really uh, Ma Olive. Creepy ghosts that you could put into your game. Ghost stories. They set in the Rainy City, but it would be easy to shift them over to a different setting. Um, and then Puppet Hands Guide to the Rainy City. Puppeteering is an important thing in the city. Puppet hands and puppet designs. And it's really creepy. And then a rogues gallery of puppets um, and puppeteers. So puppet 
Puppet Hands Guide to the Rainy City and The Restless Dead. Both are fun, but they're not my not my um, they're not sorry they're they're great. They're not sufficient on their own because you need the whole setting, and I don't have it yet. I'm gonna get it one day. Two more things. One is the Valley of Flowers. Wilderness Volume 1. This is a really interesting setting. So it comes with a comes with a map of the Valley of Flowers. You can get a sense. It's a location. Now you can I don't know if you can make it out, but it's a vague set of hexes. Uh Varen Wine Vale, Brobden Wood, Brobden Agnian, um, Beckshire. Beckishire, the Gnarl, and Golgotha. Golgotha. Lots of weird names. Hard to say names for me. Um, Sun Below Abbey. And then a bunch of locations on it. It's a really great... Uh, I always lo love games that come with maps or come with handouts and things like that. And then you get a map of a particular town. Simbrine. The Mercantile District. The Noble District. The Temple District down here at the bottom. And you get particular locations in that city. Now, the Valley of Flowers is a really interesting setting. It is sort of, as you can see, mirrored. It's Fae. We've got another great map here on the front covers. What is the sun doing today? Dripping down the bowl of the sky like wax from a burning candle, blinking like a great lidded eye, weeping softly to itself. Shining blue, casting cold rather than heat. Very strange. Very, very strange. Wildenrum. Wildenrum? where quests unfurl like the petals of the blood-red poppy, where monsters haunt the edges of the world, and the edges of the world draw ever nearer. Erther, the horned king, is gone, but his shining vision lives on, borne by countless knights over a land in the grips of a sorcerer's delirium. The sun has gone strange, and the roads are beset by phantoms and brigands. The once united provinces grow ever more isolated, ever more themselves. Now the valiant and the foolhardy alike seek glory in regions riddled with sinister enchantments. Oaths sworn, oaths broken, treasures claimed and lost and claimed again. And so the whirly gig of the seasons unveils its perilous mysteries. Wildendrum, your golden age is ended. New adventures unfold in the light of a ragged sun. The Valley of Flowers is the wealthiest of Wildendrum's nine provinces. Here prosperity grows unchecked, even as cruel wonders blossom in the ever-encroaching wild. So basically you have this sort of weird, wild place that's broken apart, and now um, and now things are going crazy. There's a brief history of this land and, and what's going on. And the factions involved, the art here, gorgeous. I love that old style fairy tale art. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. This is also very evocative and dreamy, I love it. Beautiful use of art. I think a lot of it's public domain, I imagine. Some of it's not. Standard stats for people, lay folk, magicians, priests, monsters, soldiers, terrors, rogues. So you can see the sort of game it might be. There's knights fighting on the back of bees. Beautiful. Uh, you get a nice uh, purple, purple ribbon here. And then there's the gnarl, and it's basically just a breakdown of this particular setting, which is very strange. Um, it reminds me of like, you know, fairy tale settings, Rackham Vale. Um, there's that, uh, the Northern Tier, I think. It reminds me a lot of the Northern Tier. Sun Below Abbey, it's a beautiful map. I love that map for some reason. <laughs> it just stands out to me. An Umbral Imp. Great pieces of art here in the Sun Below Abbey. The dungeon there, the Wine Dark Ghost, that's great. Oath of the Harvest, Brobden Wood. Oh, look at that piece of art. Gorgeous stained glass window. So this is just a fantastic book, and I like that each section is colored differently based on uh, the section of the of the hex that you're in. The Brobden wood is brown. Uh, this is all purple. Um, you get the uh, Beckshire or Beckshire is in reddish, like wine red. Um, beautiful art throughout this book. The back covers are green is the last. Um, oh, there's also a reddish brown here. The Shadow Farm. Great pieces of art. Just a fantastic setting. If you're interested in the weird Fae setting with, with lots of locations and NPCs, and it's sort of a medieval vibe, um, rather than just like super, I mean, it's obviously high fantasy in a lot of ways, but the vibe of the art and the tone of the descriptions and the people and the NPCs and the, the setting and, and of that is like medieval with 
weird flowery fey um, incursions. Gangs of the Mushroom Sun, uh, Slums. I really like it. I think it's a very cool book. So I would highly recommend you guys check out The Valley of Flowers as well. And then finally, I got this a while back and it finally came and I got the core rules of Break, which is an anime RPG, basically. Um, it's a fantastic little book and it, it just fills that vibe very, very well. Um, of like Ghibli or just generic anime. It's a thick book, you can see this thing is, is, is big and it's, this one's heavy. Um, it's got a nice ribbon there. Uh, break. And then the back cover. Now, this book is, this game is complicated. It's a setting, it's a setting, it's a system, it's a, it's everything. Um, and it's got tons of art that's very evocative of anime. I, I you know, I'm not, I like old school anime. Um, I'm really, I was really into Trigun. I'm really into Cowboy Bebop. I loved that. I loved, um, I like Ghibli a lot. Don't get me wrong. So anytime the art is reminiscent of Ghibli, I think it's great. Um, as a system, this is complicated. Like you would have, I would have to spend a lot of time learning this game and, and using it. But there are, but even just looking through it, I've read through it once. There are some really interesting ideas here. For example, there are mechanical benefits of putting people in different positions in the party lineup. So if you're in the front, you get different abilities than if you're in the back. I think that's really cool. I think that's a great idea. Um, you get bonuses, but penalties. Every class has a billion abilities, it's different. Um, things are, are designed to be very apparent when you look. The classes are funny um, and they're all very flavorful in the anime. Um, you know, in the genre. There's battle princesses, for example. Um, murder princesses. <laughs> uh, or princes. Um, there's the sage, you know. The different uh, races that you can play. There's like a human from our world who just looks like a nerd. <laughs> it's just hilarious. Um, the heretic. Um, yeah. The, the, the book is just fun to read if you're a fan of like, you know, a certain style of anime. Uh, there's some really interesting sealed names. These are basically warlock, um, heretic uh, patrons, warlock patrons, and they're really interesting ideas. Just even as brief, and you get more details about them as you go forward, but or as you go back. But even just briefly, Egomet, who never came to be. Right, that's a really interesting one. The idea there's a, a patron who never came to be, and here you go devote yourself to him. Yeah, here's all the different. Uh, uh, all the different um, species. Elf, Goblin, Promethean, Ral Neko, Grun, Dwarf, Biomechanoid, uh, Human Dimensional Stray, Human Native, Chib, <laughs> which is like a chibi, small person with a huge head, and Tenebrate. Um, really interesting. And again, the, the, the game doesn't just do uh, races, it also does settings and it doesn't it doesn't just do rules it also does the the whole the whole kit and caboodle so you can play this game with monsters companions um pack beasts and it has a whole bunch of pre-made ones it even has adventures in the back um a lot of work went into this book i know that i followed along when they were making it uh, with their you know updates and stuff and it's clear that they put a lot of time and effort into this and it's a it's a it's, it's a really great book if you're of a particular sty style, you know, I just think not everyone's going to be interested in this kind of game. I think many people who are more, you know, old school D&D players are not going to be interested in a game like this. But I think it's cool, and I'm glad that I have it. I don't know how much I'm going to play it. But it's one of those things where maybe at some point I'll pick it up, read through the rules, and learn them really, and be like, wow, I really want to play a couple of games in this and play it. I don't know if that'll happen, but I'm glad I have it as a mad collector. It's interesting to have. It reminds me, back in the day I played um, an anime RPG. One of the first RPGs I ever played after D&D was Bessem, Big Eyes, Small Mouth, which is an anime kind of joke RPG. And I remember my character had the ability to pull huge weapons out of nowhere. That was his whole thing. So you, you, every character got like anime abilities and his was that he could, he always had one bullet left where he could always say, hey, this is my last bullet. And it was like super powered. Um, and then I could, couldn't shoot anymore, but, it, but you, could, you had infinite bolt ammo until basically I said, hey, this is my last bullet. And it was like a big shot. Um, and then he also had this ability to pull big weapons out of anywhere. Just like suddenly he had this huge minigun. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. 
Um, and he's just walking along with just a backpack or just nothing, just his pockets and something. He's like, <laughs> which you see in anime sometimes. Anyway, I think this is fun. So that's the last book that I wanted to cover. Anyway, I hope these have been interesting. I know this is not my usual set of books, but I wanted to make something, put a video out there because I haven't done one in a long time. And, you know, I hadn't done a haul, and uh, it's getting into the third quarter of the year, so I thought, hey, I might as well do my quarterly haul. All right, guys. Well, that'll do it for this video. Hope you all have a good one. See you in another.